Hello, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land on which Melbourne Law School stands. And I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So good evening and welcome to the Melbourne Law School. I am Wendy Ng and Associate Professor here at Melbourne Law School and Director of the Competition Law and Economics Network. It is my pleasure to welcome you back to the Law School in person for this year's Bax Lecture, featuring our guest speaker, Professor Thomas Cheng from the University of Hong Kong. Now, the Bax Lecture Series was established in 2010. This annual lecture is named in honour of Emeritus Professor Bob Bax AO in recognition of his substantial contribution to the development of competition law in Australia. In particular, this lecture series recognises his significant support for the establishment of competition law as a recognised and sought after discipline at Melbourne Law School. Bob was the chair of the advisory board of the competition and consumer law specialty in the Melbourne Law School master program. I would like to welcome Bob's family, his wife, Ruth, who is up um, in the first row today, and his daughters, Miriam and Simone, who send their apologies to today's lecture and thank them for supporting this lecture series since its inception. Now, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I have some brief housekeeping matters to cover. First, tonight's lecture is being recorded and will be available on the Melbourne Law School's website shortly. A link to the website will be emailed to everybody who registered to attend this lecture. And second, after the lecture, there will be an opportunity to ask questions of Professor Cheng. Each year, the Bax Lecture is given by an eminent international or national figure in competition law and economics on a topic of contemporary relevance. And I'm delighted and honoured that Professor Thomas Cheng has agreed to deliver this year's lecture, speaking on the very relevant topic of competition law in the age of algorithms and artificial intelligence. Professor Cheng is a professor at the University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. He has written extensively on competition law in developing countries and on the competition laws of a number of Asian jurisdictions, including Hong Kong, China, and Japan. In 2022, he was named by Global Competition Review as one of the 25 most influential antitrust academics in the world. And in 2023, his co-written article received the Concurrences Antitrust Writing Award for the best unilateral conduct academic article. Please join me in welcoming Professor Thomas Cheng to the lecture. Um, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for your very kind introduction, Wendy. And thank you very much for having me here. And uh, so two apologies. First, um, Wendy said this lecture series has always been taken by eminent speakers. This is the first year when it is not. <laughs> um, and secondly, um, if you came here to expecting me to talk about how ChatGBT is going to change the field, my apologies. Uh, I think as a field, we're still trying to digest the implications of ChatGPT and generative AI on competition. So um, the technology I'm going to talk about, perhaps, it's a little bit before that, algorithms. And, um, but yes, it is still, I think, um, a cutting edge issue because as some of you may know, um, uh, algorithms, I mean, the discussion in our field about algorithms and the implication of algorithms on competition has mostly focused on collusion, how algorithms facilitate collusion. And so far, I think we have um, not paid as much attention to how algorithms affect um, abuse of dominance or monopolization um, and, uh, or I guess, a sub substantial market power. Um, and um, so that's what we're gonna focus on today. And in particular, I think the aspect of algorithms that um, is of particular interest to me and hopefully on, uh, of interest to you is uh, the prospect of uh, algorithms being used to facilitate individualized or personalized pricing. And um, there is going to be a bit of, I mean, there is still a bit of debate about to what extent it is feasible, to what extent it is practiced, and, um, and I'm going to explain that a bit and uh, 
Both examples I'm going to use today come from Uber, uh, because that's where I think uh, the, I mean, the research that we have, um, my co-author um, Julian Novak from Lund University and I have um, located is mostly about Uber and also um, Latest, um, I was at a conference in um, Delhi, a BRICS competition conference, and at the conference, uh, one of the speakers actually presented uh, a market study that um, the Indian competition, uh, the uh, CCI, the Competition Commission of India, did on Uber's ability to personalize price. So um, this presentation was updated with that piece of information because that was very exciting to me. And um, so, um, but in a nutshell, why is um, personalized pricing uh, of potential importance to the practice of abuse of dominance? Um, two things. Um, I'm going to focus on, um, first, um, I guess, monopsony abuses or buyer power abuses um, and uh, how Uber's ability to offer um, compensation, to tailor compensation to drivers individually changes the prospect of monopsony abuses by Uber. And in this instance, it actually makes it better. At least um, it reduces the welfare harm from um, potential monopsony abuses by Uber. Um, although it, does, it will result in welfare transfer from Uber drivers to Uber. The second part of the presentation is about how uh, the prospect of personalized pricing changes um, the uh, practice of uh, um, predatory pricing and uh, tying. And uh, as I was preparing the presentation, uh, Wendy told me that um, recruitment is not a required element in predatory pricing in Australia. So um, the article that on which part of this presentation is based uh, was written with a US audience in mind, and some of you may know under the Brook Group case, uh, dangerous probability of recruitment is a required em element in predatory pricing. So the original article, which hopefully you will take a look at um, if you find this interesting, focuses a lot on recruitment, but we're not going to talk about that as much uh, today. Um, and, uh, but um, the possibility of personalized pricing um, actually changes the practice and analysis of uh, predatory pricing, and also to some extent tying, and uh, that's what we will uh, cover today. Um, it, it, tying, we'll see if we have time. I was told to stick to time, uh, and uh, on a very strict order from Wendy, so I'll try. Um, and um, so, a, a lot of the discussion is, I mean, I, I would, I'll talk about the technical aspects, to what extent uh, personalized pricing is feasible, and um, so um, as my co-author and I were submitting the article to law journals uh, in 2021 and 2022, um, we, got a lot of push we got a lot of pushback from the reviewers. They were not objecting to the legal analysis. They all said, this is great, this is very interesting, but the technology part, this is the stuff of science fiction. Uh, firms do not engage in personalized pricing, and we, well, we are years away from that. And, um, but in the last year or so, when I speak to other academics about this, and they were all shocked, they were like, what? This is happening already. I mean, how can they say, how can they reject the article because they think it is not happening? But, um, um, so the, 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 the market study of Uber's uh, pricing strategy in India um, was very helpful because it gave um, very concrete evidence uh, that um, Uber actually does practice personalized pricing to some extent. Um, I mean, obviously Uber is just one, so we don't know uh, how um, common it is by other online retailers. Uh, but, um, but some form of price discrimination has been practiced by online retailers for a long time. Some of you may know, I mean, for example, Amazon um, apparently changes the pricing based on the zip code um, you're located in America, at least. Um, and uh, Uber apparently um, changes the prices based on whether you use an iPhone or an Android phone. The perception is um, iPhone users are generally wealthier. And uh, they also know how much battery you have left on your phone. And they charge you a higher price when you um, have 5% left on your battery. Um, <laughs> 
And um, so, but these are not, I mean, personalized pricing, or I guess in economic jargon, I guess first degree price discrimination of the kind that um, we um, talk about. But um, some form of price discrimination already happens. And actually, the CEO of Safeway, a major retailer in the US, once said, price tags in a store will soon be obsolete because at some point, everyone will get their own individual prices. I mean, we haven't gotten there yet, but, um, but maybe eventually. And, um, and, uh, but I think evidence of price discrimination, uh, I mean, for example, I, I'm looking for a plane ticket to fly from Hong Kong to Europe next year. Um, the more I search, the higher the prices become. I'm not sure if you guys have noticed, but on airlines, because I, I, I fly Qatar Airways, and there's an app, and I use the app, and I realized, hey, this got 4,000 Hong Kong dollars, which is about 800 uh, Aussie dollars more expensive. Um, what happened? Then um, I went on incognito mode on my Chrome, did the same search, I got the low price back. So, um, but yes, I mean, so evidence of price dis discrimination is, um, ample, but to what extent it actually, um, I mean, whether it is practiced to such fine degree as what we would call personalized pricing, I think it is still up for debate, but at least today I'm gonna to present some evidence to you that uh, at least as far as Uber goes, it is already happening. And um, so, um, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about personalized pricing a bit, but I do want to emphasize that um, for, um, at least the predatory pricing part of the analysis I'm gonna present, and actually also the tying part of the analysis I'm gonna present. Um, the analysis is not premised on the ability to personalize prices. You don't actually need such fine uh, ability to price discriminate to such fine grained detail. Uh, the, the, the analysis that I will, I mean the conclusions that I present only require the um, seller to be able to distinguish between inframarginal customers, who are the non-price sensitive customers, and the marginal ones, who are the price sensitive ones. And as long as they can distinguish between the two, um, the kind of uh, be, uh, behavior that I will describe later on uh, can take place, and it will require us to have a rethink of how we analyze uh, predatory pricing and tying. Um, and um, so the, I think the, the overarching um, um, I guess implication of, I mean, the, I guess the implication of, the main implication of algorithms for the practice of abuse of dominance is um, obviating the need for a trade-off. Um, and so when a firm practices abuse of dominance or in the, so in the context of predatory pricing, um, the, um, if we assume that the firm has to um, can only offer one market-wide price. There's no ability to price discriminate only one market-wide price during the predation period when the uh, firm engages in below cost pricing and during the recruitment period when the firm charges a super competitive price, there's only one market-wide price. And when a firm can only do that, there is necessarily a trade-off because um, during the predation period, the firm will be charging a below cost price to entice the marginal customers um, in an attempt to fend off um, uh, an entrance, a new challenge, a new challenger, for example. But the firm is also making, offering unnecessary discounts to the inframarginal customers who would have been happy to stick with the dominant firm in any case. And so, um, so what that means is that the dominant firm incurs unnecessary losses during the predation period because these inframarginal customers really need not be offered a lower price to entice them to stay or to buy more products because they were happy with the dominant firm's product in the first place. Uh, but because the dominant firm wants to target the marginal customers, they have to offer, it has to offer a discount and because a discount has to be offered across the, across the board, then um, the same, so uh, predation losses are unnecessarily inflated, if you will. But um, the um, prospect of individualized pricing, or at least price discrimination between inframarginal customers and marginal customers means that the dominant firm can now limit the uh, price cut to the marginal ones, the ones, they want, uh, the, the ones that it wants to entice. 
Um, and that would help the dominant firm minimize the um, uh, predation loss significantly. And the same can apply during the recruitment period when a dominant firm charges uh, uh, a super competitive price to recoup the re uh, predation loss. The dominant firm um, can limit the super competitive price to the inframarginal ones, the price non-sensitive ones, who would be happy to pay a high price to stick with the dominant firm's products, and um, it would not have to offer uh, the, um, to charge the higher price to the um, marginal customers who would conceivably be driven away by the higher price. So. In long story short, the ability to practice more precise price discrimination or individualized pricing um, allows the dominant firm to, ta uh, to target predation in a much more precise manner and also recruitment price increases in a much more targeted manner and that reduces the size of predation loss, makes uh, predatory pricing much more practical and um, some of you may know the US Supreme Court famously said in the Matsushita case, predatory pricing is rarely tried and more rarely successful. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the US Supreme Court has expressed enormous skepticism about the feasibility and uh, plausibility of predatory pricing. And I think one implication of um, individualized pricing uh, facilitated by algorithms is that predatory pricing would now be a lot more feasible. And in fact, um, you can even go further and say um, there is no need to have a recruitment uh, predation period and a recruitment period. Why don't you do both at the same time? Um, you can predate um, and offer the low cost price, cut, uh, price cuts to the marginal customers while at the same time charging the super competitive price uh, with your infra marginal customers at the same time. There's no reason to do it in a two step. And, uh, when that happens, um, there's no predation period, not re no recruitment period, and um, it actually makes the analysis even more complex. And um, my co-author and I uh, have not fully explored this possibility yet, uh, but we are actually going to write a book um, building on what um, I'm going to speak about later on. Uh, and um, so, but I think the, I mean, depending on your perspective, but this is, very exciting to me because um, um, th this really is, could, could conceivably change how abuse of dominance is practiced and how, um, uh, how we analyze abuse of dominance. Um, but, so, but first we get to the digital monopsony part first. Um, this is Uber's ability to offer um, more tailored compensation to the drivers. <laughs> And um, so, I mean, some of you may be familiar with um, economist uh, analysis of classic monopsony. Uh, there are three prerequisites of, uh, monops uh, for, monops for monopsony power. The buyer contributes to a substantial uh, portion of the purchases in the market, barriers to entry to the buyer's market, and an upward sloping supply curve. Uh, because with an upward sloping supply curve, the supplier can only um, reduce um, its purchase by offering a lower price. And so if it wants to suppress the price offered in the, mar the market price for the purchase, it must reduce its um, purchase size. And which means that there will be less input purchased, which also means that there would probably be less output being produced. So, I mean, as you may know, the um, classic economic analysis of, of monopsony is that um, there would be a lower level of output and it would result in welfare, um, uh, debt weight loss, just like we know that there is debt weight loss when there's monopoly, monop monopoly pricing by a dominant firm on the seller side of the market. The same result applies in uh, the, the buyer side of the market when the buyer engages in monopsony. So bad welfare effects um, and um, whether it would harm consumers depends on whether the monopsony power gained by the powerful buyer translates into the downstream market and I mean to the extent that the upstream and the downstream market are mirror images of each other, greater, bar, greater power in the upstream market would also translate into greater power in the downstream market which would allow the dominant firm to raise prices on final consumers so that would also be consumer harm. But that need not be the case but if we focus on the upstream market, clearly there would be reduced output in the upstream input market and there would be that way loss. And so not good. 
Um, so here, um, the, but if Uber is able to engage in um, more targeted compensation offered to the drivers, and we know that they can and they do, um, so in other words, if Uber is able to um, practice price discrimination against the drivers, basically offering higher compensation to drivers who multi-home, and we know that some drivers do. Um, I don't know about the situation in Melbourne, uh, but in a lot of jurisdictions, um, I mean, and I was in LA recently for a conference and I was speaking to a very friendly uh, uh, Uber driver who proceeded to give me his entire family history for the last 35 years, including where every one of his children works. They, all four of them are nurses, interestingly. Two of them work in Southern California and two of them in Dubai, and I, I can tell you even more about that, but anyway, so, um, the interesting thing, I mean, he, but he also tells me a lot about his driving practices, and he drives for Lyft and Uber, and one thing I discovered which shocked me, but I guess I shouldn't be, um, so we started talking about um, pricing. I, I also talked to an Uber driver yesterday uh, coming from the airport to town. I love talking to taxi and car drivers. I love trying to understand, I love trying to understand the economics of um, taxi driving, but um, the little geek in me. Um, so in Melbourne, um, the drivers don't know how much they get paid in advance. That's what I was told. In Southern California, they do. And um, so I, I'm chatting with a Filipino driver. Um, I was paying $86 for the, for the Uber. I mean, it was a one hour ride. It was very far. He was getting 50. Exactly. I was like, wow. Then I spoke to the driver yesterday and I told him again, I'm getting 50, I'm paying 56. Um, he, he didn't know how much he was gonna get paid yet, but he said, I think I'm getting paid about 30. So he was not surprised, but I guess we as consumers are. And I mean, this actually, um, this point about whether drivers are able to find out in advance how much they get paid would actually be a relevant point later on in my discussion, but uh, realizing that I've already talked about um, for 15 minutes and I'm still on my first slide, I will. <laughs> it happens very often. Wendy, don't worry. So, um, Uber, um, so we know this for uh, facts that Uber does that, but Uber has something called a hell program. I don't know if it's practiced in, in, in Australia, but we know that it, they, they practice it in, in, in the US. Um, and basically, by combining the data they have of drivers who drive for the competitors, in the US the main competitor is Lyft, and the data they have of their own drivers, they can figure out who, which driver might be helpful. Uh, oops, I think. Ah, okay. Um, so the, which driver multi-homes? So they can figure it out. Um, uh, and then what they have done is they start offering better incentives to these drivers. Basically, they offer them better rates. Um, they offer them um, rebates if they reach certain number of rides, monthly, weekly, monthly targets. But basically, um, drivers who multi-home get better terms. And they are able to tailor the terms fairly precisely based on each driver's um, uh, 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 practices and preferences between driving for one or both um, cap hailing services. And um, so the, the um, but be, um, and um, I mean, Uber in a way is a very good example because Uber knows a lot about their drivers. They know a lot about their driver's ability to drive, willingness to drive. And in particular, I mean, so I said it would be even more helpful um, to, I mean, I said the point about Uber drivers knowing how much they get paid in advance would be a relevant point later. This is where um, it is. And if Uber actually discloses uh, the fare in advance to drivers, then Uber can really figure out their willingness to drive. If I offer you this fare for a, a, a ride from airport to um, downtown Melbourne and you don't take it, then I know that this is too little for you. And if I offer you a higher fare later on, um, that, and you're willing to take it, then I know that you, that's, I mean, by doing that, by offering 
disclosing the fare information in advance and seeing whether you're willing, you're willing to take the ride. Um, Uber can figure out a driver's willingness to drive pretty accurately. But um, they, do, they do that in, in Southern California. My understanding is they don't do that here. But, um, but Uber actually has a lot of information about their drivers. Um, and um, so what, what, th what that does, I mean, by allowing Uber to basically tailor the compensation they offer to the drivers um, and um, individually or, or, or very individualized uh, compensation, uh, what that allows Uber to do from the perspective of, of monopsony is, remember when I said with monopsony, the, uh, the monopsonist has to, I mean, the monopsonist, the, in the classic monopsony model, the monopsonist offers one purchase price for the input. Um, and, when the, and when that is the case, the monopsonist can only reduce, in, uh, can only suppress the price by reducing its own um, demand for the input. But because of the possibility of um, personalized compensation for drivers, Uber can, I mean, price discriminate. And Uber no longer needs to offer one compensation, one price to drivers, and Uber can actually target its drivers, um, uh, I mean, can tailor the comp compensation to its drivers according to their willingness to drive. And what that means is Uber can, um, can actually approximate first degree price discrimination. I mean, for those of you who know what that means um, in dealing with its drivers. And what, that, what, and what that means is, and so for those of you who are uh, familiar with economics, um, e economists tell us that when first degree price discrimination is possible, the market outcome uh, clo clo uh, closely approximates uh, the outcome of perfect competition. The only difference is that there would be a transfer of uh, producer surplus to uh, Uber as the, as the buyer. So, I mean, the, the drivers are harmed, but um, output level is not reduced. There's no debt weight loss. And, um, and actually, the, um, the, the market output would be what perfect competition would produce. So, in this respect, um, the ability to, um, to individualize compensation to Uber drivers actually reduces the, um, the welfare harm of uh, possible monopsony practices by Uber. And um, so, I mean, scholars have talked about other kinds of uh, competitive harm of monopsony or buyer power abuses, um, like water bed effects, quality erosion, creation of downstream power. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna elaborate them, but, um, the, um, my point is that those are uh, unlikely to be relevant in the context of Uber. So the good news so far is that the ability to, I guess, individualize price, if you will, uh, as far as Uber's interaction with drivers is concerned, actually is beneficial uh, because it reduces welfare harm. Uh, although, I mean, obviously it, um, it results in um, uh, surplus transfer from Uber drivers to Uber, which could, could be deemed a bad thing depending on your perspective. But now um, onto the predatory pricing um, tying part. Um, so I, this is the study that I, re I, I referred to earlier. I, I'm not going to go into detail in the interest of time, but um, apparently the CCI, the Competition Commission of India has paid quite a lot of attention to Uber and U uh, Ola, the uh, Indian count counterpart. And, um, and I guess surge pricing is something that has attracted a lot of attention, at least initially when it was first introduced across the world. So this um, market study looked at surge pricing, but also looked at personalized study, uh, personalized pricing. Um, um, again, I'm not gonna go into detail about how this is done, but they did a survey of drivers and riders, I think they surveyed about 2,000 of them, on the perception of whether personalized pricing is practiced. But they also did a natural experiment. They basically had, I think, 68 riders uh, all ordering rides um, from the same location at the same time. And they did a control experiment. They basically timed the market conditions in such that, um, I mean, these are people who were at the exact same place um, they placed, I think, um, six orders at five to ten minute interval, 
And what they observed is that there was the personalized pricing because the same people, um, I mean, different people were getting different prices. And um, for a variety of reasons. And um, so um, Uber, I mean, actually, we don't know which of them it was because it was anonymized. But uh, um, there were two, um, they, call, they call, it, call them cab aggregators, but basically ride-hailing services in India. We know that one of them is Uber. The other one is Ola. One of them denied that they do. They do it. The other one, yes, I said, admitted, yes, we do personalize discounts and, uh, and other terms to some extent. But I guess, long story short, I think, it, um, I mean, at least the CCI is fairly comfortable saying that in light of this study that personalized pricing by, uh, it does happen in the ride-hailing service market in, in India. And um, so I think I'm going to skip. So, um, so what does this all mean for um, the practice of predatory pricing and, uh, and also, as, as I said, tying? Um, so, yes, we, so now we are talking about combining predatory pricing with, I guess, if you will, price discrimination. Um, um, I mean, if it, it is truly personalized pricing, then we're obviously talking about first-degree price discrimination. But as I said, um, the analysis here does not actually require the dominant firm to have the, to have the ability to uh, price discriminate to such precise extent. Uh, the only thing that is required is that, is that the dominant firm can distinguish between marginal and inframarginal customers. But um, so, <clears throat> as I said earlier, with um, the ability to price discriminate um, and basically offer um, the below cost price cuts to only the marginal customers and the um, super competitive prices to the infra marginal ones, the dominant firm can now um, minimize the predation loss um, and actually pr practice both re uh, predation and recruitment at the same time. And it makes predation uh, more feasible, less costly and um, and um, it I mean it also makes recruitment much more likely. And I, I know recruitment is not a requirement, but you can imagine basically the predation loss is going to be much it's going to be much smaller as a result of um, uh, more targeted price cuts. And with a smaller predation loss, obviously it is easier to recoup your loss. And so recruitment is also more feasible. And um, and also the ability to Price discriminate during the recruitment period also makes recruitment more feasible and can also maximize recruitment. So overall, um, predation is uh, much likelier. Uh, I mean, it's much more feasible than before. And um, <clears throat> so, um, and other, um, <clears throat> so I mean, now let us to the, the uh, price cost comparison, which I think still is still a required element in predatory pricing in Australia. So in addition to recruitment, um, individualized pricing also has implications for the price cost comparison part of the analysis. I mean, if you think about it, obviously now there's no, no longer one market price for the predation. So how do you do the price cost comparison? And when, I mean, one, one possibility obviously is to just aggregates all the prices and calculates the average revenue or, or the average price offered to consumers. But um, the problem with that is um, you would also include the prices offered to the inframarginal ones who were not subject to a discount because now that predatory pricing is pr uh, practiced in a much more targeted manner, um, some customers will be, sub uh, will be offered a below cost price cut during the predation period, but some customers may get nothing they may still be charged the same price. And if we calculate the price the, for the purpose of price cost comparison by aggregating the price offered to all customers, we would be artificially inflating the price. And that obviously makes it less likely that the price will be found to be below cost. And so um, we would need to, um, I mean, so ideally we would, um, we would only uh, use the price that is offered to customers being offered a price cut. 
and we should exclude the price being offered to uh, the customers who are not benefiting from the below cost price cut. So that um, is what we need to do in order to uh, make sure that we get the right price and not um, use an artificially inflated price for the purpose of the price cost comparison. Um, so the appropriate cost measure, um, this part is a bit more complicated because, um, it, um, I mean, for those of you who are familiar with the debate about predatory pricing, I mean, there's this long running debate about what is the appropriate cost, cost measure. You may be familiar that, um, 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 it, I mean, um, American scholars have argued that marginal cost is the right cost measure if you can find out what it is. But, um, it, I mean, marginal cost is notoriously difficult to calculate. So, um, Professor Philip Arida from Harvard Law School proposed that we should use variable, average variable cost instead. But average variable cost usually in this context is calculated on a firm-wide basis. And um, the problem is uh, now not the entire firm-wide output is subject to predation. And so should we use the entire cost of, the, I mean, the cost of the, in, the firm's entire firm-wide output as the cost measure? It seems like we shouldn't if not all of that is subject to predatory pricing. So, um, so what cost should we use? And I mean, here at risk of getting a bit technical. Um, so the um, appropriate cost measure here would focus on um, the firm's response to the emergence of a competitive threat. I mean, predatory pricing usually arises when a dominant firm faces a challenger, a new entrant into the market, and a dominant firm all of a sudden needs to react to try to neutralize the threat. And so uh, what the dominant firm is required to do then is to increase output, reduce prices, um, in order to take away customers from the new entrants. And what the dominant firm ideally wants to do is to take away as many customers from the new entrants so that the new entrant is denied of economies of scale. And so um, the, the new entrant can't make money from its operations and exits the market. And so the dominant firm will have to lower prices to sell to more customers who previously were not the dominant firm's customers but who are now enticed by the by the new entrance product. So there's, there's incremental output, new outputs that is being produced to um, try to take these new customers away from the, uh, from the, um, from the new entrant. And so we, let's call this the incremental output. And so what um, my co-author and I suggest is that, so we should use um, the cost um, incurred to produce to supply this incremental output as part of the cost measure because this is the competitive response, this is the predation part um, that the dominant firm um, um, now is now supplying at a lower price in reaction to this um, new emerging threat. And, but at, in the meantime, the dominant firm, part of the dom existing dominant firm's customers may now be interested in the new firm's offer. Uh, because there's a new firm emerging, a new uh, alternative. Some of the previous, um, some of these customers who previously may have been inframarginal are now marginal. They are willing to consider alternatives. And so the dominant firm probably would need to lower prices to these customers to uh, hang on to them. And so the dominant firm would have to, as I said, offer a, a discounts to these, I mean, below, perhaps below cost price cutting to these existing customers to hang on to them. So the cost of, uh, of supplying these customers should also be included. And, um, but here the difficulty is because these are existing customers to the extent that the dominant firm does not actually keep separate records of the costs. Um, and to the extent we only have the cost data for the existing firm-wide output and the dominant firm does not segregate between different customer groups, then we may actually have to, for the purpose of these customers, use the average variable cost for the existing firm-wide output. Um, and um, so um, that is how we would try to construct the cost measure for the price-cost comparison. Um, and uh, apologies if I was getting a bit technical there. Um, so now the last bit, tying two minutes. Um, 
Um, no, I mean, it's, I, I'm going to keep the discussion fairly um, straightforward here. So, I mean, again, this goes back to the trade-off facing a dominant firm when contemplating an abuse. With predatory pricing, the trade-off is between offering um, the low-cost price to marginal customers to entice them or hang on to them, but also offering the, uh, the, uh, the discount to customers who didn't really need the discount in the first place. So with tying, the, the trade-off is between um, customers who, um, I mean, so when a dominant firm uh, imposes a tie, um, there are customers who don't like the tie product of the dominant firm and decide that they're not going to buy the dominant firm's tying product at all because they just don't want the do dominant firm's tie product. So they defect after the dominant firm imposes a tie. But, um, but there are customers who like the dominant firm's tying product so much that they're willing to put up with a tie and um, buy the tied product as well. So when a dominant firm imposes a tie, there's this trade-off. It makes more money from those who are willing to stick with the tie, who are willing to put up with the tie, and, um, and buy the tie product as well. But it loses money from those customers who are so pissed off by the tie that they just give up the dominant firm's product com combination altogether. So there's this trade-off. And I'm sure you now get the drift, obviously, with um, individualized pricing or algorithmic targeting here because we're not talking about pricing anymore. But of course, if the uh, tie is imposed through bundle discounts, this is also a pricing issue. But, um, but with algorithms allowing the dominant firm to, uh, to identify um, inframarginal customers and marginal customers, and marginal customers are those who would walk away from a dominant firm's for dominant firms tying tie product combo. The inframarginal ones are the ones who will stick with the dominant firms uh, product combo because they love the dominant firms tying product so much. Um, so with, with algorithms allowing the dominant firm to distinguish between these customer groups, the dominant firm can impose a tie only on the inframarginal ones and um, not impose a tie on the marginal ones hence minimizing the lo potential loss from uh, imposing a tie. And what that means is a, dominant, um, a firm can impose an effective and profitable tie with less market power. Because um, when tying has to be imposed across the board in the market, the dominant firm loses revenue from the, uh, from the marginal customers who defect. And so um, the dominant firm has to have a fairly substantial degree of market power with the inframarginal customers to make the tie worthwhile. But now that it can impose a tie in a much more targeted manner, it can minimize the loss from the marginal customer's defection. It doesn't need the same amount of market power to make the, the, um, the tie profitable. And so, um, so that, I think, is the main insight from our analysis, which is that um, tying would now be feasible and profitable at a lower level of market power. Um, there are other um, insights as well, but I think I'll stop here, and uh, if you're interested, I can uh, talk about them during the Q&A. But thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Thomas, for that lecture. It was very interesting, and the reason why I keep the time is to allow for ample questions from the audience. Uh, so we'll now take questions from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question and an MLS staff member will find you and hand you a microphone. Please wait until you get the microphone because we need to ensure that the audio is captured for our recording. Uh, when you ask a question, please say your name, your affiliation, and ask a question rather than a comment. Uh, so yes, anyone with a question? Hello, I'm Vaibhav. Uh, it is that observation uh, regarding Uber and Ola. Uh, I'm from India and I observe the same, like in different cities, they have different prices. So how to control it? Like whether sh government should regulate it, price regulation mechanism or something like that? Um, interesting you mentioned this because, um, I mean, in the study, one of the one of the focuses of the study is whether Uber, 
Actually, it's anonymized, so I shouldn't. <laughs> um, so, uh, so whether the cap aggregators, as they are called, um, charge different prices in different cities. So the study was done in Delhi, Mumbai, Jaipur, and I must confess, I had never heard of the last one before. In indoor, indoor. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I, I, I never heard of it before, but yeah, so they did a study in those four places and they found that um, um, the cap aggregators charge different prices in different cities. So uh, to, as to your question, what should the regulator do about it? So th there are two separate issues here. So one is the price discrimination part. Um, so do we, uh, do we think price discrimination is problematic? Uh, do we regulate it? Um, so, I mean, Charging different prices in different cities, um, I, I, I mean, I, depending on, I mean, I, I don't know what you guys think about price discrimination, but I think probably riders in Mumbai can afford a bit more than riders in Jaipur. So I think charging different prices in different cities, I would imagine is fairly reasonable, but I think obviously what we're talking about, I mean, what really, I mean, I think what catches people's attention about personalized pricing is not that Customers in different cities are charged different prices, but but you and you pay different prices um, because of what the what um, the cap aggregators perceive to be your willingness to pay. Um, so I think that's a separate issue, and um, whether I I mean personalized pricing should be regulated, should be banned. Um, I, I I guess I I guess. I'm copying out of that question by saying that that's not the main focus of this, um, of this presentation. This presentation is about how um, personalized pricing and algorithmic targeting changes the practice of um, abuse of dominance. And I mean, predatory pricing and tying, I mean, clearly could be uh, illegal under some circumstances. So there's no question about it. And how does personalized pricing and algorithmic targeting make them easier to practice? But as to whether personalized pricing should be regulated, um, that's a separate issue. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I probably don't want to wade into that debate. My here, question but. was related to personalized pricing as well. Uh, because I think that uh, if they know on the consumer behavior, so uh, they have unfair advantage over the local price, uh, uh, local market. So if the government regulate like price regulation, like you can so, charge so they have unfair advantage over who? Over the uh, local markets, like those who don't have that, uh, that much data. Or, the, for example, the Uber is uh, providing ride-hailing services, right uh, services, and there is uh, local taxes in Mumbai. So they have unfair advantage over local taxes because they don't know the consumer behavior. They cannot study it. So like that. Right. No, I, 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 see what you, I see what you're getting at. I, I think that is um, an emerging issue. I mean, more broadly, you have these um, online retailers who have a lot of data and also the ability to, to analyze the data to understand more about the customers. And um, I mean, uh, but yeah, but they have advantage um, re with respect to data because they have the ability to collect the data and they have the ability to analyze the data. I mean, I guess the question is, do we want to make that um, a violation to analyze data and to, um, to collect data and analyze data? I think that would be quite a controversial proposition, but I mean, you're right. I mean, the, um, the competitors don't have the same access to data and that is becoming um, a, a problem because it makes it much harder for them to compete with the likes of uh, Uber and Ola. Does anyone else have a question? Thank you, Professor Cheng. It's been fascinating. Staying within the context of the ride sharing example, if drivers know that they get a better deal by multi homing, does this create an incentive to multi home? Such that sort of such a strategy could prove counterproductive. Um, yeah, you would imagine it does, uh, but in my limited sample of one uh, in LA, uh, my dear friend from the Philippines, uh, he does not. He switched from um, Lyft to Uber completely 
a few years ago, and he told me why I forgot what it was. It didn't register as, I mean, I, I don't want to say legitimate reasons, but, but the, the reasons didn't really make much sense to me. But he was saying that he switched from Lyft to Uber a few years ago because Uber was better. Um, um, and then, then I told him, oh, yeah, you may want to consider multi-home. He was like, okay, thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you would think so, but apparently um, all this happens without the drivers knowing it. Um, so, I mean, but, but I guess with the internet, nothing is a secret. You would imagine someone should know eventually and should start telling all the drivers, but at least I, I haven't heard of a, a tsunami of drivers multi-homing in, in the U.S. at the moment. But, but yeah, no, I mean, I mean, that would be a very logical uh, assumption if you get better terms from Uber by multi-homing, then you should do it. And um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I no, I I, I I was gonna I was I was trying to recall what I've read about how many driver how many percent of drivers multi-home, but I, I can't remember the exact figure, so I probably shouldn't speak. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, anybody else with a question? Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering whether you personally advocate for Uber drivers to know the price before they accept the drive, given that from the consumer perspective, it might not be beneficial, especially for these trips, which would be less valuable as they might not be accepted la later by the drivers. Um, whether I um, would agree with Uber disclosing the fare in advance to drivers um, interesting. Um, let me pause and think about it, about this a bit because not strictly speaking about. Um, I mean, I, I guess I, I guess I would be okay with it. I mean. Um, so actually, there are two layers to, to, the, uh, to the issue. So uh, in some places, I don't know to what extent it's still practiced. The drivers don't even know where you're going. Yeah, and I, I know that's the case in Hong Kong. Um, I mean, I'm, for those of you who know the geography of Hong Kong, there's an island, and taxi drivers hate crossing the harbor because the tunnel is always congested. And I've had Uber drivers call me at, as they were approaching, asking, are you crossing the harbor? And I'm like, none of your business. <laughs> and then they dropped my, um, my, 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 my ride. Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, there's that. I mean, I guess at the very least, I, I, I would be okay with telling them where they're going. Uh, I mean, the precise fare, um, I mean, my sense seems to be that Uber drivers have a good sense of how much they would get for a particular distance. So um, I think even just telling them the, the destination of the customer uh, would be, um, uh, I mean, would be helpful enough to them. Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, maybe. It, 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 I don't think it's a bad idea for, uh, I mean, they, they should know where, where, they, where they're getting themselves into. I mean, I guess the, the reason why Uber did not disclose that in the past was because they didn't want people to pick the rides. Uh, but, um, but apparently, um, if you turn down rides too much, you get demoted. Yeah, yeah, so, I mean, so I, I think, the, the Uber drivers also have an incentive to pick up some rides, uh, I mean, with a reasonably frequent uh, fr uh, frequency. So I guess that would, um, I mean, keep the incentive to pick rides in check. They, I mean, they can't um, skip too many rides before they get demoted in the in the uh, in the ranking. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, thank you for the lecture so far. It's been great. I just had one quick question. Was there any evidence from the study um, at all that Uber's conduct in predatory pricing per se has substantially lessened competition in the rideshare market? Ah, right. Sorry. Um, so um, I, I'm not saying that Uber has engaged in predatory pricing. So um, Uber, I mean, Uber is used as an, exa an example to illustrate the ability of an um, of a digital platform practicing more targeted compensation or individualized pricing. 
So uh, no, I mean, I don't think there's evidence that Uber is engaging in predatory pricing. Uh, so it was really just used as an example to illustrate how a digital platform can practice the kind of behavior that is needed for me to build my uh, analysis on. But, uh, but actually, what Uber is accused of doing with the HELL program uh, of offering targeted uh, compensation to drivers is to lock them up. Um, so it, it's actually uh, an attempt to secure exclusivity from the drivers. So actually, I believe it was in response to, um, yeah, it was in response to an entrance. Uber was trying to lock up as many drivers as possible. So, um, so the, the, yeah, the original impetus of the health program, it was not predatory pricing. It was actually exclusive dealing. But, uh, but yeah, they were, use, they were trying to use in, individualized pricing to, to achieve exclusive dealing, yeah. Can I follow up on that? So was there any evidence to suggest that competition in the market was actually harmed? Um, so, um, so my co-author, Julian Novak, mm. so he discovered this. I don't know where he f read about it. He found, and I, I don't think it was ever investigated. So I don't know if there was actually a, a, a formal conclusion that Uber's behavior here excluded rivals and by locking up drivers. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, but I'd imagine, I mean, the supply of drivers, Uber drivers, probably is quite elastic and, and it may be a bit difficult to try to lock all of them up. But I mean, I, I don't think it, the case was ever formally investigated, so I don't think we have a definitive conclusion. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll use my prerogative as moderator to ask the final one. So you mentioned that one of the implications is that the practice of the, the, pred the predation period can coincide with the recruitment period by charging the um, infra-marginal ones a higher price and giving a discount to the marginal customers at the same time. Doesn't that transform the nature of the conduct itself? It changes from predatory pricing to just price discrimination. Yeah, or cross-subsidisation. Cross yeah, exactly, yeah, cross-subsidisation. Yeah. So it, in that sense, how does it change the legal analysis? Um, that's something I plan to explore in the book. Um, so <laughs> That was not a setup. I was no, 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 no. I mean, a perfectly legit question, and I, I mean, I, I highlight it in, in my presentation. But yeah, I mean, because to be honest, that changes the paradigm so completely that... Um, when I wrote the article, I, I hadn't thought that th far. I was still in thinking within the framework of traditional predatory pricing analysis. But yeah, I mean, I mean, do you even call it predatory pricing anymore? It's just good old um, cross subsidization with a below cost component. Uh, I mean, there's still predation if you focus on the, uh, the price cutting part. But but yeah, I mean, there's no formal demarcation. Yeah, I mean, I I, must, I invite me back in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well. If there are no more questions, thank you once again um, to thank Thomas you, for you. still bringing this to his lecture. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I guess we should shake she hands. Has. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you to everyone for attending this year's lecture. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Marina, Casper, and the events team at MLS for helping to organise this event. Uh, thank you for attending. We're very excited because this is the first in-person lecture for a few years, and I hope to welcome you back next year for next year's BACS lecture, which I'm already planning, so watch this space. Thank you and good night.